Hello, welcome to another podcast. I do not believe who we have in the podcast today on stage is going to be treated fairly, really, really well with Bill Boggs, who's been interviewing celebrities, musicians since the 60s, 70s. Oh, and um, Mr. Boggs, of course, he's, he's a Philadelphia native. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He's got a BA. He earned a master's degree from Annenberg School for Communication, but let him tell us about himself or we don't have any need for him. So, Bill, welcome to the On Stage podcast. We have a professional here. I can't wait to talk to you. Yeah, well, tell you us a little bit. Have to make, you know, I've been, Bill Boggs has been very busy, which we will be talking about. So, you have to really make sure that I'm not just a Bill Boggs deep fake avatar who's going to be spewing some of Bill's meaningless cliches <laughs> for the next hour. <laughs> or I think the real Bill Boggs, but it's up to you as an interviewer to dissect, dissect and decipher that. Hey, I'm, I got the world famous interviewer Bill Boggs on my podcast. So I'm looking forward to getting any learning or te teaching from you. Or This is awesome. So, yeah, Bill. I'm ready to roll. Yeah, Bill, do you want to give us a little bit of a background of who you are and what made you start into getting into interviewing? Well, I think that, you know, what gives me the, uh, you know, there's a term sometimes used like, the, what is someone's rosebud? You know, it comes from the movie Citizen Kane. What, what is it? We say the inciting influence in someone's life that might not be uh, evident to people. And in my case, when I was about four, I would say, yeah, four, maybe five at the most. My parents bought me a little radio, and I'm old enough. I'm actually lucky that I'm old enough to have lived through the very end of the golden age of radio. And you had shows that were talk shows. You had comedy shows, drama shows, special effects, The Lone Ranger, a lot of the early big TV stars like Jack Betty, Bob Hope, Burns and Allen. Uh, some of these names are you know, rapidly be, becoming forgotten, I began on radio. And it was something about a couple of the shows that I listened to. One was an Art Linkletter show called People Are Funny. Another one was an Arthur Godfrey show, and a uh, show that came Don McNeil. And I knew, being a male, that I was going to be growing up and working. I'd see the men go off. This is the 40s, you know go off beginning of the day to work and then come back tired at the end of the day. And I, I kind of thought, gee, what I want to do in my life, I want it to be possible, as much fun as possible. So I just said, that's what I want to do. I want to be like the men on the radio and then television. I, my mother tells me, I was about five years old, walking around the house with a, a, a pencil in my hand pretending to interview people. So wow. that's how it started. It started because of an interest. So I'm one, of, I'm, I'm one of those really lucky people who made a childhood dream come true, you know? Do you remember the very first interview that you did? The very first person I interviewed was Colonel Sanders, uh, Kentucky oh. Fried Chicken. Yeah. And, then, and then shortly thereafter that, the host of the show I was working on as an associate producer of KYW-TV in Philadelphia couldn't go to the world premiere of a movie called Fool's Parade, which is one of Jimmy Stewart, the actor's last movies. And then so the second interview I did was with Jimmy Stewart. And then the third one was with Strother Martin, who was in that movie, Fool's Parade. And it went, you know, downhill from there. Well, 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 tell me, tell me, tell me about the interview with Jimmy Stewart. What was he like in real life? Well, uh, yeah, he uh, talked kind of slowly and uh, very measured, pausing, and a sweet man. You know, I told him, you know, I was starting to do this, and he was, uh, I, I've always felt in my life, you know, when I was a waiter when I was in college, the first week that I was a waiter, I said, you know, I'm new with this. I'm going to try to do my best today. Let somebody know the reality of the situation. Because he was a military man as well. So, but... Yeah, um, I, he was yeah. in the airport. 
World War II? Well, look, <clears throat> if anybody, people watching now, if they want to see some of my work, they can go to my YouTube channel. It's, it's free, right? It's Bill Boggs TV. So if you go to Bill Boggs TV on YouTube, there's about 400 interviews. I'm just going to, off the top of my head, I'm going to say some of the people whom you can see on Bill Boggs TV. Um, let's start with women. Natalie Wood, so Sophia Loren, uh, Jane Fonda, Shirley yeah. MacLaine, um, Melba Moore, Mabel Mercer, Bing Crosby, Sean Connery, Frank Sinatra, Jerry Lewis, wow. Sammy Davis Jr., Penn and Teller, David Cassidy, Jerry Stiller, and on. And there's a lot there. So, and that's really my archive of my life's work. Um, and um, we add to it almost every month. I add something, I find something. Uh, and uh, so that, you know, it's hard. It's hard. I, I've always said Frank Sinatra was my favorite guest, but among, you know, among, I've been blessed to interview a couple thousand people. They weren't all celebrities, believe me. Um, but uh, I like Sean Connery. The Sean Connery interview was wonderful. Charlton Heston, that's not on the YouTube channel. Charlton Heston. Tony Curtis was extremely, Kirk Douglas. They're all, you know, this is one period of time when big name celebrities were coming on local TV to um, essentially promote something, a book. Tony Curtis was on with two different books. Kirk Douglas was on with a book. Sean Connery was on promoting a movie. Then I move into my Food Network show uh, where essentially I interviewed celebrities and their favorite restaurants. And they use it, sometimes it was a quid pro quo. You know, like today, the quid pro quo was, I'm happy to do the podcast, I want to talk about my latest work. That's the quid pro quo on a talk show. And um, Sophia Loren had a book, so she did it. And Penn and Teller were performing in MGM Grand. Joan Rivers was just a friend. Joan Rivers, wow. Joan Rivers, excellent show with Joan Rivers on Bill Box TV. You can also see Sophia Loren there and a lot of people, a lot of people. I urge people to go to Bill Box TV and subscribe. It's free and you get notifications when we put new stuff up. Rather than the, the gnarled face that you're looking at now, you see young me, I'm there on Bill Box TV. I will always be there. Scrolled all the way down. I'm like, Whoopi Goldberg. Wow. You interviewed Whoopi Goldberg. Um, what was she? Well, Whoopi, like, what I was she? Show, I did a show called Comedy Tonight with my business partner in Bob Baker Productions, Richard Baker. And Comedy Tonight was um, the first show in the history of television. It was syndicated all over the country. It might have been on a cat. I don't know. Uh, Comedy Tonight was the first show in the history of television that just featured stand up comedians. It morphed into live, I think, live at the improv. And uh, on, that, on that show, the pilot, Whoopi Goldberg, did two of our pilot shows. So that's when she was appearing on Broadway, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg on Broadway, directed by Mike Nichols. So I've known Whoopi for a while. And then when I went on the, my Food Network show, Bill Box Corner Table, and when I first started that, I had to call on people whom I knew who would sort of do me a favor and spend like an hour and a half of their time. Whoopi was one of those people. Matt Lauer was one of those people. Martha Stewart was one of those people um, early on. Yeah. Um, earlier on, you were talking about that you did um, interview Frank Sinatra. Now, we have a mutual friend who mentioned that you had quite a strong friendship with Frank Sinatra. I like to talk about that. But, I mean, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't go overboard and describe it as a strong friendship. I would describe it as a relationship where I probably was in his presence uh, maybe 12, 15 times. I did the longest interview of his career. But I, I'm quick not to add hyperbole you know, to what I've done. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't describe myself as a friendship. I knew it was one. I'm one of the guys still around who knew Frank Sinatra. That's just put it that way. My son, who lives in Trevor Box, who lives there in Toronto, actually went with me and saw Frank perform seven times in his life. 
had started as a nice. little boy. And, and Frank met Trevor when, let's see if I can get Trevor's age. Yeah, I can get this. When he was seven years old, he met Frank. And Frank leaned way down and he looked at Trevor and he said, never get old, never get old. <laughs> Double meaning there. Before we talk about your second book, Spike Unleashed, about your dog, um, I want to talk about this other book that you wrote from Har Harper Collins called Got What It Takes, Successful People Reveal How They Made It to the Top. And yeah, I see that I see that you have interviewed <clears throat> Donald Trump. What was he like to interview? Who? Donald Trump. Oh, Donald Trump? Well, um, I interviewed Donald Trump. Donald Trump long before he ran for office. I interviewed him, well, let's say in 2007. So that's nine years before the election. Uh -huh. um, and of all the guests, it, guests, the people whom I interviewed and got, got what it takes, like Sir Richard Branson, Diane von Furstenberg, Joe Tory, the baseball guy. Uh, there's a lot of Joe, Joy Behar, uh, Brooke Shields. About I interviewed these people about the uh, internal qualities that led they're being successful. And of course, you know, Trump's brand is being successful. But he was the only one who actually, even though I knew him socially, you know, if you're in New York and traveling in certain circles, I moved to New York in 1975. I met Donald Trump the first year I was in New York uh, at Regine's nightclub with Geraldo Rivera, Francine Lefrac, a bunch of people there. Um, so he was the only one who actually didn't do an in person interview. I submitted the questions. And then he, he answered the question. So you'd have to read the book. But the, the answers were good. The answers were good. Well, I don't want to get yeah, too right. political. Right. So polarized that simply by saying that Donald Trump gave good answers to questions in 2007, people will try to have me canceled for saying anything. But the, <laughs> the answers to the questions were good. It has nothing to do with what's happened in the United States since 2016, I assure you. That's why I don't want to mention anything about his presidency, but I'll ask you, uh, did You're you ever get a chance? To, <laughs> did you ever get to interview him? Did you ever get Did you ever get a chance yeah, to interview him as president? It was on Midday Live once, and I interviewed him. I was working covering boxing for Showtime. Uh, I interviewed him at a couple of the heavyweight championship fights. Notably, I think uh, uh, Tyson, uh, let's see, Foreman at that fight. That's cool. Um, and Renee Zellweger now, what do you think of her new look? Have you seen her lately? She's so different now. Well, isn't that like a story from seven years ago that she started looking different seven years ago? Is this another iteration of that? I like I like the way she looked seven years ago. I don't like the way she looks now, but she changed her look for some reason. I don't know. Well, that's that's the current trend. That's the current. It's trend. Like Madonna, what she did to her face. I mean, like really, Madonna. Well, you know, I, like don't, I don't think Renee's, Renee's not in that category. She's not. In that category. <laughs> Jane Garland, would you please get me one of those books that's under the TV? Thank you. I just hand it to me. It's under the TV. Go ahead. Yes, my young friend. Yeah, um, you said you had so many interviews and so many accolades, and I really appreciate you being a motivational speaker for Vistage International. Uh, yeah, well, that, what is got what it takes? Um, led me to uh, I've done several things other than you know being blessed to be on television on fifteen different shows, but that led me to be able to be travel around the country and make a pretty good living as a motivational speaker. Um, mm. I did about 100 talks around, maybe more around the country because I wrote that book. The talk I gave was basically stuff I would have been giving anyway, but the book sort of codified me as somebody who could talk about success and the things it would take to be successful. Yeah, but now you also interviewed musicians, and was there any particular musician that – um, not only made you think, but helped you in your life as an interviewer? Uh, a musician who helped me in my life as an interviewer? No. Like Miles no. Davis or like when you interviewed a musician? What do you, you mean by help me as, as an interviewer? 
I mean, I know that when I interview, I know a lot of people help me with like, they become inspirational. I'm like, yeah, I should be doing that too. Or I feel that way too. Was there any particular interview that made you go away with like a, yeah, they're right. Or yeah, I should, or. No, be brutally honest. Uh, no, I would say no. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, I appreciate that. Uh, what's, what's the uh, syndicated show all star anything goes i don't think i remember that one uh it was a, a show based on an english show it was a cbs i did while i was doing a show called midday live in new york i took a hiatus from that show went to the west coast and we taped a syndicated series for cbs syndicated though and it was um, teams of celebrities playing crazy games about each other unfortunately i I don't have tapes of any of the shows. I have tapes of a lot of stuff. I never got tapes of those shows. It was sort of a stupid, silly show. It paid very well, and it was fun. I had a good time doing it, a very good time doing it. It wasn't the sort of show I would have actually watched, uh, which should be a telling sign when you take a job. Hmm, would I host something I wouldn't watch? These days, yeah, but then I'm so Anyway, it was just good to get the money and the national exposure at the time. Anybody would love to do what you do, especially when you get to um, interview all these celebrities, musicians, or even anybody. People would love to do it. Like you're like the male version of Barbara Walters. Barbara Walters used to do a oh, lot of really? her interviews. No, Barbara a lot Walters. Of her interviews. Uh, she's in the class yeah. by herself. I'm just a humble guy. <laughs> through life as a talk show host and, and now a writer. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so about the Saturday Morning Live, you replaced Gene Raber, and I remember him from Match Game. Um, yes. That was a show. That was a very good show. One of my favorite shows. Two, it, it, it ran for two years uh, on the East Coast. Saturday Morning Live. Two hours live. I believe we started eight. 8 to 10 on a Saturday morning, and it had a lot of information. There was always cooking information, fashion information, home repair information, and I was the host. I took over for Gene. I was happy to do it. That's a period of time when then I was working six days a week doing live television during that because I worked Monday through Friday, then Saturday morning live, then I had, I had Sunday off. At one point, when we were doing comedy tonight, taping on both Saturdays and Sundays, my my personal record for hard work was nine straight seven-day weeks on TV, 63 straight days in front wow. of the camera. Yeah, I know. How, did you, manage, how did you manage to do that without suffering burnout? A lot. Well, I didn't get burned out. No. I mean, the burnout would come. You know, Springsteen said an interesting thing. He was talking about his voice and how he's pretty much taking care of his voice. And he said, um, you know, you don't really lose your voice doing the show. Uh, the, the, the voice gets abused after the show, partying, screaming, and stuff like that. So the temptation during those 63 days was just to stay away from New York nightlife, stay away from the restaurant scene, and focus for nine straight weeks on work. Wow. Wow. Um that's amazing. So you were in Oz, Miami Vice movie, Eyes of Laura Mars, but you played yourself. Uh, well, you got so many accolades, Bill. I'm just like, really? Oh, you're I'm very actually, smart, really. I, yeah, I've been in like a few movies playing myself. What would you do if you couldn't interview anymore? Do you have a backup plan? Doesn't need well, your I mean, voice? If you look at my resume, the last, um, which you have, the last show that I had where I was interviewing people essentially it was seven six years ago and then we that at the start of the pandemic we did a show called trap live which is a podcast like this but um i'm not concerned really that i'm not interviewing people now i mean i it's not written someplace chris that you're supposed to do something for the rest of your life i mean mm -hmm. i've had my share i've had my my fill as you know sinatra sings in my way you know to think i did all that so when my last show went off the air, which was called My Generation, it was on PBS, when that show went off the air, I thought, you know, I've been chasing jobs my entire life. I've been very aggressive 
and pursuit of career goals. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you're stepping on people being ambitious, but it means you're trying, you're out there looking. And, and Chris, basically, uh, I thought if someone wants me for television, you know, I'm available, of course, and I could be doing a podcast, but we stopped doing Trap Life. I'm focusing 100% and identify myself now as a writer, as a writer of fiction, as a writer of, of, of essentially a writer of satire. And I've, uh, in my life, I've written four books. The first was called, the first was 1980, it was called At First Sight. And then 2007, 2008, Got What It Takes. And then in 2020, just when you want to release a book, like in the middle of the pandemic, very good time. Um, the Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog came out. That's called The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog. Actually, here's the book. As told mm -hmm. to Bill Bog. So, by the way, this is not a children's book, my friends. See, that says <laughs> politically incorrect humor. We put that right yeah. on the cover as a warning. Warning. Wow. <laughs> And so that the book got, ex, I'm not bragging, just saying got excellent reviews. And so I've written a sequel, which I consider the single best work of my life. The book is called Spike, Spike Unleashed. Unleashed, The Wonder Dog Returns. Yeah. And that book's coming out. That book's available now for advance order. Well, everyone, um, make sure you uh, have to read the first book about Spike. Well, so the book is, and then... Here's it's Spike the Wonder Dog. Read that one first, and then read Spike Unleashed: The Wonder Dog Returns. Um, we're going to read some accolades here. Um, well, we have. Before uh, you do this, yes. Let me explain what these are. Um, when okay. the book is it's going to be published soon, you go to people, reviewers, other writers, and ask them if they'll read the book. Do you a favor? Read the book so that and give you a blurb for the book. This and the accolades you're reading now, Chris, about to read a few of them. Thank you. The book, book can be ordered simply by going orderspike.com or Amazon type in Bill Box book, right? Uh, orderspike.com for Spike Unleashed. So go ahead. I appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Bill. And I wouldn't mind you sending me an autographed copy as well. <laughs> but um, we're going to read one from Bob Costas. I really like him. He's a Hall of Fame broadcaster. He's well, really Bob a Costas, old Hall of Fame broadcaster. Great guy. He's a, he's he a said, yeah. Go ahead. He says about this new book, Spike Unleashed. Old dog, not really. New tricks, plenty. Turns out Spike has more to say and more encounters with the virtuous and villainous figures of our time than any person, let alone canine, I know. And that's from Bob Costas, and we are familiar with him. Um, another one is from our favorite um, comedian's daughter, Lucy Arnaz. One of the first things that attracted me to Bill Boggs decades ago was his incredible wit and his enchanted sense of play. Now he's found a way for his alter ego spike to allow the bog sensibility to continue to flourish. It's great fun spending time with the two of them. And uh, give you three more. And this one's from Joe Piscopo, who we know. Mike, the, Mike Reese Sorry? from The Simpsons. He just Mike Reese, one of the creators of The Simpsons. Somebody introduced me to him, and he said, "You're writing comedy now." I said, "Yeah." I said, and so. Read the one we just got this two days ago. I, this knocked me out. Mike Reese, writer and producer of The Simpsons, everyone. This is what he says about his book, Spike Unleashed. Not since Voltaire, I know how about him, has someone written such an epic, funny takedown of the world in which we live. Yes, I'm comparing Bill Boggs to Voltaire. Wow. Yes, I am. A, he may have spent a lifetime in entertainment just to craft this scathing, hilarious look at popular culture. Bill's written an amazing, funny book and so hip. So let's Thank read you. some more. Mike Reese, wherever you are. Yes, Mike Reese. Um, I'm not sure about this. There's a ton of them, like all these accolades. Oh, Tom Cotter, comedian. This is what he says about Spike Unleashed. Spike's antics are a feast for your funny bone. This bull terrier takes no bull <laughs> and could kick Lassie and Scooby's ass with one paw. I like that. Tied behind his back. Legendary TV host, Bill Boggs, Lampoon's show business, media, and fame. 
taking the reader on a hysterical comedic journey through the zany antics of Bud and Spike. If laughter is the best medicine, this book can cure cancer. Read it or I will rub your nose in it and throw it outside. That is funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> so tell us whatever came the reason why you wrote a book about Spike. Well, it's it's not a book about Spike. It's a novel. Mm -hmm. And a novel. it's a satirical novel. And it's written from the point of view of a dog named Spike the Wonder Dog. And sort of loosely based on a dog I had many years ago who was on my TV show. And the dog gets to be a huge television and social media star. His master is a talk show host, sort of like me. And it's a series of adventures about, and it's basically about the price of fame, what fame can do. But the, the overarching emphasis of what the book is, it's, so, it's satire, as those people are saying. I'm looking at society through the eyes of an outsider, a dog. A dog is looking at human foibles. A dog is looking at human excesses, and he's, and he's commenting on them. And um, for the first book, Winston Groom, the, who wrote Forrest Gump, the late Winston Groom, the last book he reviewed in his life was The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog. And he said, Spike is the funniest dog ever to appear in fiction. So this is comic. This is designed to make you laugh out loud. That, that's, hmm. that's what it is. The first book with the distinctive yellow cover, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, available. And uh, the second book, Spike Unleashed, coming out soon, orderspike.com. And uh, if you don't have a laugh reading the book, uh, I'll give you your money back. But how, you can't prove it. You could just be saying to me, <laughs> I didn't see that. I yeah, and we'll link that all below in the description, everyone, so you can purchase his books. That's amazing. Um, what I'm really – yeah, um, Spike the Wonder Dog, that seems to be very interesting. I, I can't wait to read it because um, I need a laugh. I mean, I've watched Seinfeld for years. Oh, there's a guy. Has, get Jerry Seinfeld. Have you ever interviewed him? Oh, yeah. I had a dream about Jerry Seinfeld last night. I had a dream. Jerry and I were talking about the writing process that went into Spike. Upside down, Jerry. Uh, that's true. I actually had a, this morning, I had a dream about Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, I've met Jerry. We're not friends or anything. You know, when you're in New York, geez, I've been in New York since 1975. You meet people and you're in show wow. business, you know. So it's like a club. So yeah, I've met Jerry. Love his work. I love his yeah. show, Comedians in the Car Coffee. The guy Me too. is so confident. He is really a confident interviewer. Yeah, um, when I first started this podcast, I was like kind of nervous with the first or second or third, and then it kind of got easier when I went and watched other podcasts and other interviewers, and and, and I'm, I, I may not be Lex Friedman or Joe Rogan or Rich Roll or Rick Bento, but uh, you know, and even Jordan Peterson, I, I'm just trying to do my best, be, and it it helps me talk to people. Um, before I was like introverted, now I'm sort of intro outro verted sort of not not perverted just intro outro verted. <laughs> converted you're, 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 you do you do stand up comedy chris Is that what you're saying? i should i should do stand up oh, no. comedy <laughs> i'm not sure no no i'm actually a singer i'm a tenor but um i've oh, had really? people rolling in the aisle yeah I, I'm a tenor, but you say um, you're a tenor, you mean an operatic, operatic tenor, or I, I do sing a lot of Italian, German, French songs. Yeah, wonderful. I love singing. It helps singing, me release all the anger. Or, and he, the tenor always gets the girl in the office. You know, the baritones. I remember Pl Placido Domingo, who's on the YouTube channel. We mentioned a while back. I did a half hour interview with him. You know, he's the tenor always gets the girls. Not the baritone, the bass never. Maybe, maybe one. So, I noticed, yeah, when you did interview Frank Sinatra, though, like, what? Well, it's not like Bing Crosby who who went golfing quite a bit. Did he ever ask you to go golfing with him? <laughs> golfing? Did I yeah. ask like Bing Frank Sinatra about golfing? No. No, Bing I Crosby. When you I talk, don't Bing, I actually you don't never golf. asked anyone about golfing. 
If I get back in the television, the first question I ask will be something about golfing. Then I'll be able to cross that one off the list. So do you make a note of people you interview? So in case like they send, come to you and say, we want you to interview, but I've already done that. Or do you just interview them again? Oh, no, it all depends on who it, it, it's. It's like you're booking a podcast. It's whoever, whomever you can get for your show. I mean, you might not have somebody on two days in a row, but um, no, not not in the least. Yeah, um, that's very interesting. And over the years, it's like every time you're interviewing someone, doesn't it get to the point where you just want to give up? Excuse me? Isn't it Wait, come I, to a I'm point where you... Sorry, it just comes to a point when you just want to give it up, like just give up because you're tired of talking, you're tired of interviewing, you're tired of the traveling. No, not, not in the least. No. Uh, I, I, uh, well, at one point after doing it for, uh, after being on television as a talk show host for 16 straight years, I did want a break, and I took a break for about four years. I uh, was executive producer of the Morton Danny Jr. show and then executive producer of Court TV. And I got back on with WNBC in New York. Um, but <clears throat> there's no mystique to it. You're talking about interviewing, it, you know, it, it, it's just like a job. You can get sick of anything. But if you need to make a living, you keep doing what you're doing. If you don't need to make a living, then if you're sick of it, you don't do it. Right now, nobody is offering me any job um, as a, a television host. I mean, you know, at, at this advance, I become like the guy who's the pro, who's still around, they want new people. That's, that's how I got in. I replaced an older guy, they want to get rid of him. And I, that, so that's just a natural transition. Interesting. Um, you got to keep going because I bet you if you just stop, you just stop. It's like, well, I've already, so you want to keep going. Um, now, with your interview with Jerry Lewis, uh, Martin and Lewis were a team. Did you interview them together or just one at a time? No. If I had interviewed them together, it would have been, let's see, they, Martin and Lewis broke up, I think, in 1959. So okay. to interview them together, I would have been in high school. But, um, no, I interviewed Jerry Lewis. I, he was promoting a movie called Hardly Working. And I interviewed, actually, did, there's a full one-hour interview with Jerry Lewis on the Bill Box TV YouTube channel, right? Um, I'm... We talked a little bit about Jerry because Sinatra had reunited them at the telethon. The first time they had seen each other and talked to each other in decades and decades. So we talked a little bit about that. And uh, Jerry, like, sort of wistfully said, it's a shame it couldn't continue, but who knows? You know, I, say, I don't pretend to be an expert on Jerry Lewis, mm. but, although I certainly had a good relationship with Jerry Lewis over the years. First met him in 1980. When I was on a book tour doing oh, wow. a talk show in Vegas, and Jerry Lewis was on the same show. That's when I met him, 1980. So, what was the pandemic like for you? Because knowing that you couldn't go out and meet people, you had to be six feet away. Did you do a lot of interviews online, like Zoom and stuff like that? Like, well, that's where everybody was doing at that time. That's when we. That's when we did um, the, the podcast trap live. Everything was online. Yeah, 100. percent Everything was online. Were you afraid to go out? Because I know we have neighbors here, and uh, they don't, they don't, they didn't go out for two years. They didn't even touch their it's doorknob. Right, right now, right now I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. Okay, and we spent Jane Rothschild, my beloved girlfriend, and I spent the entire pandemic down here, uh, right on the beach. It felt safe. We didn't feel like we were making many sacrifices. We we read, we watched with horror what was going on around the country. And um, so the pan, you know, the pandemic was not difficult for us in terms of our lifestyle. Our friends in New York, had, some of them had a very difficult time. There were no stores open in their neighborhoods. But I would, do, I would go shopping, put a mask on, get the food, come home. And then we just pulled back. You know? Nothing's wrong. Look, the pandemic was horrible for people. We didn't have children. We didn't have children who, uh, there she is in the background, by the way. Jane, in person. Wave, Jane. There she is. Right. Hi. Hi, she says. Hi. Yeah, we didn't have children. We didn't have to worry about school. Uh, we didn't have to worry much about work and what we were doing. Um, 
obviously some of my speech, I wasn't doing speaking engagements, which I do now, and I've been for years, I didn't do that during the pandemic. But uh, right now, my concern is, uh, you know, lingering pandemic. Uh, I've had mm -hmm. my vaccination, but who knows? You meet somebody, they could be sick. And more and more, you go to restaurants, and restaurants are very noisy, and somebody comes to your table, oh, they want to talk to you. That's great. That's really nice. They're this far away yelling in your face because of the noise. Around. <laughs> that, that I don't like. I don't want to believe me. I don't like that. I keep backing up. Yeah. I was talking. I was talking to somebody two weeks ago, and this person was so much in my face, talking in a loud restaurant at me like that. I was against the wall. Then I shifted around. He got against the wall. Then I backed up and backed up. But the guy had bad breath. Not. <laughs> right, Jane, right, Jane? I do. She of remembers it. Of course. <laughs> but of course, you. Well, at least you had someone with you, I think, for those two years. There's some people who, who no, just absolutely. lived alone. Yeah. Many yeah. people just had their pet dog. I had Jane. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye, Jane. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jane. Bye bye. <laughs> You have fun. Um, well, yeah, it must have made you feel like pandemic. What is that going to do? Is, are we going to all die? I had someone call me and start crying, saying, oh, we're going to die. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. <laughs> you know? Or did you like with strength say, you know what? I'm Bill Boggs. I'm going to get through this. <laughs> no, no, I was extremely careful. I'm still, I'm still very careful. I mean, I'll give you one of the things I never do. Mm hmm if I'm sitting having dinner and somebody comes to the restaurant, a well-meaning person, whether I know them or not, I will not shake hands with them while I'm having dinner. And if I go to someone's table and they're eating and they reach their hand up, I do the bump. I, I do the bump, um, which I originally picked up in St. Lucia in 1992. The natives down there, when they greet you, they don't, you know, they're not shaking hands. They go like this, watch. Stick out your hand, Chris, as if you're doing the bump. Your hand, as if you're doing the bump like that, yep. then they go mm -hmm. on their heart. Bump. Oh. And I thought that's nice. So I've been trying nice, to yeah. work that in. But I had one guy, um, and one guy, I don't know whether or not he was like an anti vaccine guy or what. And we're in a restaurant, and the guy didn't want to do the bump. I said, well, you don't want to do it. So he, he punched me in the shoulder. And <laughs> I took my, no, I put myself at, I nailed this guy three times right in the bicep. I said, Oh my goodness. Don't punch, don't punch me, pal. And oh, wow. Was, that's the only time, the only, the only twice in my life that I ever strike somebody. The other time was when I was in uh, basic training. It just pissed me off so much. That this guy would punch me hard. That oh because, my you know, goodness! When a bully pushes you, as my former business partner Richard Baker said, when a bully pushes you, you push him back if you can. Wow! Well, yeah. Thing I've said in the last forty minutes. I try to bump people as well, but not literally. Like if they're standing by the railroad track, I won't bump them. You know what I mean? <laughs> But, but I agree totally with you. Yeah, because of the post pandemic. But hopefully, I mean, we, everything's opened up. We can do things again. Go to bars and restaurants and stuff. That's that's good. I was noticing that your favorite book is an autobiography by Moss Hart. Why is that your favorite book? Uh, act one, the book, a biography of Moss Hart. It's just Shakespearean. It's funny. I was thinking about that book this morning. It's just it's Shakespearean in it. His rise from poverty to his great success uh, and his writing abilities. Is, is, I love, really like autobiographies and memoirs. And I, that's Act One is the best autobiography I've ever read. Well, but why do you like that one? Is it because you're, it's just, have you read any other books? It's, it's a redemptive story. It's a man okay. who came from nothing who not little was expected of him, but he had this aunt who introduced him to the theater 
Um, whether it's a redemptive story, I don't know, but it's certainly a rags to riches story. I mean, real rags. And uh, I like Moss Hart said, air conditioning. He was, it was so hot in the tenement where they grew up. Air conditioning is the greatest invention of the 20th century. Have you, do you read your own books when they're published? No, no, you know, um, every once in a while I'll, I'll dive into the, you know, the adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog, or I'll think about something I could have added to it, you know. But no, no one, once the, the process of writing involves a lot of editing. The key thing is you have to be prepared to write badly and then continue to refine it and refine it and refine it through editing. So by the time the book actually goes to press, I have read the book at least carefully, at least five times, making deletions, a little bit of additions and things like that. And once they come out, the feeling I get is just to take the book and hold it in my hands and say, oh, and have a moment just with me. Wow, you know, I did this. And it has nothing to do with anybody else or any ego. It, it, in order, <laughs> I said to Jane, in order for me to write a book, I have to get up and do it. I have to get up and do it, you know. It, it, there are a lot of people who have excellent ideas for books, excellent ideas, but they're intimidated. They don't think they have time. They, they, you just have to sit down and start, and you have no idea where it's going to lead you. For me, it's led me here to talking to you about the Avengers of Spike the Wonder Log and, and Spike Unleashed, you know. And do you, how do you want to be remembered? As an interviewer, a, an author? Just, just as, you want as somebody. Actually, I like to be remembered by the people whom I've helped in my life, that I help people along the way. Jack Lemon, the actor, um, said you have to, the current term is pay it forward. When you hit the top, you got to look down and reach and bring other people, bring other, bring other people up. I just, I like to remember somebody who, who helped people, right, and had a good That's sense of humor and like and like to make people laugh. I, since I, as long as I, I was in a comedy team in high school, in college, I got into in the show business, managing a comedy team and supply and writing a little bit for them. Um, honestly, making people laugh is probably the thing that gives me. Oh, I would say the greatest, an enormous amount of satisfaction. That's something we want to have on your epitaph. He made people laugh or he made, he helped people, something like that. I think it should be, we'll be back right after this. How many times <laughs> I said that in my life uh, between commercial breaks. And we're you going to see that soon. We wrap it up in three minutes here. Go ahead. Yeah, you ever seen that um, thing about this guy who wrote on his epitaph? You are where I once was. I am where you will be. <laughs> um, yeah, Ooh. and everyone, please, <laughs> please go to the description and, and go to Bill Boggs TV and, and watch all the interviews. You also got one of Carly Simon, Billy Carter, Jimmy's um, brother, Howard Stern, um, Sammy Davis Jr. It's amazing. And a lot of these are just that's, that's the way Bill, Bill Boggs TV. Channel, yep. Yeah, interviews nice. people is amazing. So basically, what is next for you? Exactly what I'm doing. Promoting Spike Unleashed, The Wonder Dog Returns. Mm -hmm. Try staying on top of that until um, that promotional period of a few months is over this year. And then I will start writing a third Spike book, which will likely be called End of the Tale, the third Spike book. Uh, the, the big What's next for me is selling the books as an animated cartoon series. If, some, if anybody's watching right now who has a contact in the world of animation entertainment, like at Netflix, Adult Animation, Adult Prime Animation, FXX Network, Cartoon Network, um, or any of those, and they're looking for content, we've got 600 pages of original comedy. I'm shot, I believe by this time next week I'll have an agent representing. This is my ultimate goal is to sell the property, make some money, rent a villa in Tuscany, and invite wow. about 12 of my friends over there for a week at my expense. That's my goal. That has been my, originally oh. it was gonna be a yacht, originally, mm -hmm. but I think, I think 
it's simple for people just to go maybe fly into Florence. And so that's my goal. My, and if it, if it costs me a quarter of my advance, I'm going to do it. You know okay, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't written a book yet, but I like to write my memoirs and just all the things that have happened during the last 50 some odd years. And I don't know if it's going to be funny, but I had funny parts happen in my life. I kind of embellish it just for people to laugh. I don't want them to cry when I tell them things, you know. <laughs> but OK, everyone, uh, like I said, please subscribe to this channel and Bill Boggs TV, the YouTube channel. And his information is down below in the description. Thank you, Bill, for joining us on the on say podcast i really appreciate the oh, one more thing and... May I say yes one go more ahead thing? Yep. follow me real bill boggs instagram real bill boggs instagram a lot of interesting i think it's interesting stuff on there i'd love to be able to connect with some of the people who've been watching this so it's real bill boggs on instagram chris thank you very much good health to you i hold on just a second yeah, let me see. So Bill Boggs, real Bill Boggs. Okay, Chris. I could have done this. I'm following, following you right now. There you go. I just pressed follow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Peace. Thank you for okay, following. We're gonna... Bye bye. Folks. You're... Adios. Bye, everyone. Really appreciate interviewing you, Mr. Boggs. And you, I'm going to let John know. And thank you very much. Okay, everyone. You're welcome, Chris.